Welcome to Mayim Premier Reviews. This is our last week in our M Night Shamama month. As we talk about its, I mean, a truly Bahamas movie, <laughs> the happening. Uh, not only did it lose money, it stars Mark Wahlberg, and I'll, I'll read a quote from it, but he also was embarrassed by it. It's just, it's a mess. But, you know, there are heroes, like Hot Dog Guy, and a terrifyingly unblinking uh, Andre Plaza. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening, thanks for enjoying, thanks for supporting. In honor of its setting and the fact that it feels more and more like in the world every day, our next episode will be based on Soylent Green, a movie that takes place in 2022. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. Thanks for listening, thanks for subscribing, and thanks for all you do. Bye, guys. Welcome to Myopia Movies. This week we end our middle of the second month M. Night Shyamalan twist of a Witty twist. Yeah, series. Uh, with his first R rated movie, The Happening. Uh, something that somehow turned a huge profit. In which the ants discover biological warfare. Yeah. Very good. I'm uh, Nick Hoffman, uh, Riffron Center Prom, and member of uh, Myopia. I don't have any have. Oh, sick, bro! Hi, this is Daniel, frequent uh, contributor to Popdose.com and a frequent panelist on Myopia. And I am Atlanta author Matthew W. Quinn. Check out my debut horror novel, The Thing in the Woods, and its sequel, The Atlanta Incursion. Short and scary, which I'm not sure if that applies to this movie. It's at least short. Um, Thank God it's 90 minutes. That's the one good thing I can say about this movie. Credit where it's due, Shyamalan, to keep him tight. Yeah, I will say that. Uh, I don't think any movie we've done has been longer than an hour 45. Um, but this is the final one of the month. Uh, we've done now, if you're just tuning in, I guess, uh, we did uh, Signs, The Lady in the Water Village, and now we're doing The Happening, uh, famously his first R-rated movie, um, which is, you know, is what it is. The Lady in the Water, we didn't mention when we talked about it, which was the one even right before this, was not only a critical failure, but a flop. Uh, it cost mm. 70 million to make, not counting advertising, of course, which they never published. Uh, and it only made 72 million. So oh, this movie is a critical flop too. It made money, but only because the budget was so much lower. Well, and you can see that here. Uh, the movie looks terrible compared to some of his other stuff. Like really, truly, like, and something you notice when you watch even the village. The village looks like a movie you should like. It tricks you in that way. It looks incredible. This movie looks terrible. You got punked, bro. Yeah. Oh, sick, bro. Hey, bro, you think they're going to bring back uh, Roger Deakins for this one? Hello? Anyone? Um, so, uh, I guess we should talk about it. We've been doing a lot of our, our Mark Wahlberg impression. Uh, Mark Wahlberg uh, apparently signed on this right away because, of course, he did. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> you have M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, okay, what was his actual cameo in this one? Because I don't even remember him. He was Joey, the guy who uh, Zoe he, Deschanel had dessert with one time. Right. Oh, uh, the, the phone when, creep. Right, him. That's such a weird, stupid, unnecessary twist. Like, whatever. What a twist! Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering if he was going to show up and Marky, Marky Mark would have to kill him, but yeah, I guess the trees got him. Well, I mean, Marky Mark's not going to kill him because... Uh, I don't think he's Vietnamese. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, so we should talk about Mark Wahlberg. And he wanted to do this movie because he always played a tough guy. And in this one, they let him be a science teacher. That's it. That's the reason he did that, which I guess is a good reason as any. Um, anyway. Uh, so apparently, this, uh, this is the quote that he had. Uh... Amy Adams was originally offered the part of Zoe Deschanel's character, and she turned it down. Oh, now, why would she turn down such an amazing role? Well, this, I mean, right. Uh, anyway, so this is Mark Wahlberg's quote. Uh, we had... <laughs> we had... Ac- I can't do it. Uh, we had actually had the luxury of having a talk before another movie, and it was a bad movie that I did. She dodged the bullet, and then I was able to... I don't want to tell you what the movie... All right, the happening. Fuck it. It is what it is. Fucking trees, man. The plants. Fuck it. You can't blame me for not wanting or for wanting to try to play a science teacher. 
at least I wasn't playing a cop or a crook. That's it. <laughs> oh man, the fucking trees. <laughs> like, hey bro, the trees. Yeah, I think they're trying to make some kind of point about like the decline in the bee population here. Well, that's that's where we start. With literally a conversation about the declining bee population. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, Which was a thing for a while. Is Mark, that still happening? I think it still is. Yeah, it's still a thing. But And be careful with your pesticides. Well, I mean... Thank you, Matt. Uh, we should kind of talk about the beginning of this, though. Because the beginning of it is nuts. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I guess technically on this show, we generally uh, do some sort of plot synopsis. Uh, but I guess Mark Wahlberg's angry quote kind of already gave away the plot synopsis. Um, but does anyone want to do it? I'll, I'll do it. Go. All right, so in New York City, people are all going about their day in Central Park. It's a lovely, shiny morning. Then the wind starts blowing, and people, for the most part, like, suddenly freeze in place. And then they all start killing themselves in various ways that make you wince. Like a dude pulls out like a pencil and shoves it in his own throat. Oh, that's the woman reading the bad romance novel or, and can't remember the page or she's on. Some, or there's some construction workers and all of a sudden you see one guy throws himself off, then another guy and they look up and suddenly there are waves of dudes just walking off the top of the building. And that that is squicky. Uh, squicky? It's like something like Ugh. Oh. even makes me like Ugh. Yeah, so we're starting with these two women who are, like, talking to each other about the book they read. Because they're, like, reading the book together, and they know what page each other's on, which is crazy. Uh, she takes a chopstick out of her hair and stabs it into her neck. Yep. Um, but what happens to these people is the... Let me let's be honest. This is Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. He's making The Birds here. Um, but what happens is you see the wind blowing in the trees... Uh, they're in Central Park, and then all of a sudden people stop moving. That's that's the first step. People stop moving, and then they start acting irrationally. You have one guy who starts walking backwards. You have people who are kind of floating around. You have, like, a dog who brings his owner back a ball, and um, the owner doesn't respond. Right. And then people start killing themselves uh, very quickly. And like you said, people start jumping from uh, skyscraper. Um, the... Anyway, that, that, that's kind of what's And I don't know if this happens in New York or maybe in Philadelphia. There's like a, a cop shoots himself and drops his gun. There's a conga line of like everyone around him just picks up the gun and shoots themselves. Yeah. That's uh, a nice way to put it. Like it's a conga line because, yeah. Dun, 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 bang. Dun, 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 bang. You know what? More amusing and more engaging than anything in this movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the deaths here, but like. The movie overall is, like, there's a lot of really bad, like, how do I put this? The screenwriting is very interested in the fact that people are going to kill themselves. But that's kind of it. Like, like when we get to the construction workers before they start to kill themselves, like, we start with a bunch of people telling the punchline of a dirty joke. And then someone falls, and then we look up and we see more people falling. Now, this movie would have worked so much better, and we only covered, like, the opening scene in terms of the plot. So the rest of it is Marky Mark uh, finds out that there's some sort of play going on that makes people want to commit suicide. So he evacuates his family to rural Pennsylvania to try and stay ahead of the virus or the it's, pollen it's, or whatever it it's is. It's played as like 9-11 again. Right, basically. And uh, yeah, will he succeed? We don't know. But anyway, uh, what would have made this movie work a lot better is if it had done something like Night of the Living Dead did and nobody knew what was going on. I mean, we constantly cut away to other characters we've never met uh, committing suicide in grisly ways. But that would have worked so much better if it was, like, glimpsed on a TV screen by Marky Mark as they're evacuating, or... Oh, don't worry, that would be cell phone footage. Um, you know what? That would have been a lot better. Don't cut to those scenes. Well, I mean, also, we don't know why it affects certain people and it doesn't affect others. Like, theoretically, all of New York should be dead, but they're not. Because, like, what you describe with the people jumping off the roof, right, on the construction site, we see it all through, like... I don't know, the foreman, some dude who's watching all of his friends die. He's having an emotional reaction. What would be even more terrifying is if he wasn't reacting at all. 
but we don't know. We have no idea why some people react and some don't. Maybe Marky Mark actually oh. should have died, but for some reason he's the solution. He's the re- like. There's some people who can't get this like this effect. Um, you, know, you know that flower that like blooms once every couple of years and smells like a corpse and everybody. Raise yourself. I think it's called a corpse flower. Okay, the Raise corpse flower. Previous episode, of Dennis the Menace. Well. Uh, yes, that's right. Either way, um, uh, that's, I think, essentially what Marky Mark thinks is going on. It's some sort of corpse flower scenario. <sighs> I, think, I, I think it has to do with how close people are standing to each other. So this is a movie about the importance of social distancing but about 15 it years earlier. But, yeah. It doesn't. Because remember, eventually that lady with the most metal death of all is like by herself outside in the woods and just her. And she's the only one who dies. Right? Oh, was that Betty Buckley, the old one? Yes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, smash cut eventually here to Marky Mark at the front of the classroom. And he's like, try to talk about the bees. And no one gives a fuck about the bees. And he's like, he's hey, not bro. doing science. He's just like going, okay, this is science, bro. We're just going to spit out ideas and then see what works and yeah. you know, what we all like. Hey, bro, what's killing off the bees? And someone goes, like, uh, the temperature raising might be confusing them. And then this is like this, this good-looking dude in the corner goes, you know, in a few years, you're not going to be so handsome. So you better know science, you asshole. And, well, maybe they're trying to do hypothe- you know, the hypothesis stage, like come up with ideas for why something's happening. Well, even, I'm being charitable. It doesn't work that way. Uh, okay, he's a high school science teacher. Um, uh, he's clearly got a bottle of scotch in his desk somewhere. Uh, I guess this is what we should expect. I mean, but, like, I, I, I don't know what he's doing. Like, him playing a science teacher is bad. But, like, also, it doesn't matter. He doesn't figure anything out. He's, by the end, he's no closer to an answer than anyone else. And all he does is steal a hot dog guy's idea, which we'll get to. Because hot dog guy? Favorite character in this movie. Again, Night of the Living Dead. They weren't figuring out what was going on there either. But it didn't matter because the audience was pulled in and was equally as confused. By trying to figure it out but not giving anyone a definitive answer, my God, man, rewrite well, the goddamn script. I mean, in a second, we, we got to get to this. Um, so Mark Wahlberg is, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had dealt with bad news in a workplace, but he's running around the classroom screaming, oh, it's the Doc Lawrence here. Um, and it's the vice principal, and she has a thousand-yard stare. This is the equivalent of making fun of someone who's about to tell you about 9-11. Remember that. Um, but what she's doing is they're gathering all the teachers into a... It's like, an auditorium. An auditorium to listen to Paul... Um, this is where they did The Sound of Music last year, bro. That's right. Uh, listen to uh, Rock. It's Alan Rock from... Uh, yes, from Speed and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And, and uh, Star Trek Generation. And Twister and... Um, but he's telling that the... the he's going to call me. He's going to keep calling me. Is he calling the auditorium? All right, I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> I see what you did there. You did Ben Stein. Anyone? Um, Anyone? Hoffman. Anyone. Hoffman. <laughs> but, well, my point is, he pull, they pull all the teachers out of all the classrooms. Well, we see kids watching footage of this happening on their phones, and there's no teachers in the entire school. Yeah. It's fucking chaos. Yeah, like, what, yeah, that's not a good idea. They're going to like run around in the halls and st- at minimum. Well, I mean, it, it, like, it's just chaos. I mean, like, you get bad news at school, the te- you get an announcement to check your email, and they explain what's going on, right? Um, but we're introduced here to John Leguizamo, uh, who is a math teacher and is terrible at his job. I thought by proxy after um, uh, Encanto, we don't talk about John Leguizamo. I'm just going to let that sit there for a second. Oh, no. No, no. It was my wedding day. No, okay. Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, what is this 9-11 that you're referring to, Nick? I don't recall ever hearing about that. Well, you're, first of all, you're not supposed to forget about 9-11. Oh. Uh, yeah, so Dudley was all about is a guy named Julian. Um, he has a daughter named Jess that we'll eventually meet. Is he, is he um, uh, supposed to be Zoe Deschanel's ex-husband or something? No. Uh, his wife is in town... It what becomes one of the most awkward, terrible scenes. Uh, buying his daughter a birthday present. So mom dies because she went to buy you a birthday present. Happy birthday, kid. 
Um, Mark Wahlberg is married to Zoe Deschanel, uh, Elliot Moore, and Alma Moore, which is a terrible name. Again, yeah. M. Night needs better names. And they're having some sort of unspecified marital problems. <laughs> See, that's why I thought Leguizamo was her ex-husband, because he acts real weird around him. Well, yes, but, 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 dude, he gets the worst. Okay, uh, so John Leguizamo is like, smells something's up because uh, Mark Wahlberg is kind of dancing around his wife and them having some uncomfortableness, right? And he goes, I don't know what to tell you. At your wedding, I saw her crying, and you're just like, don't tell me, Matt. Never tell anyone about that. That's like a secret you take to the grave. Like, that is the, the so bad. <laughs> it's awful. Um, uh, at this point, like, after realizing that uh, his wedding, his marriage was doomed from the start, we're introduced to Zoe Deschanel, who's watching CNN or something. Uh, or no, they make him a fake news network here because no one wanted to touch M.I. Shyamalan. FNN. FNN, right. Um, and, like, um, they don't know if it's only stuck in New York, but at this point nothing has happened in Philly yet. It's a New York phenomenon. Um, what we, about Boston, bro? I know. The, the uh, Bosox I'm not here. allowed to go back to Boston. I'll tell you later. He's in <laughs> Southie. Um, there but, was some unpleasantness. So I can never go back. I'm not allowed to sit in grocery stores, bro. <laughs> um, and uh, Kroger doesn't want me in their stores anymore, bro. I said certain types of people shouldn't be clerks. You know what I mean. Um, we see that someone named Joey keeps calling. Um, and here's the thing. This is a movie that stinks of, you should have looked it up online, because we have a woman we're introduced to, um, uh, the medical correspondent for WNN, World News Network, named Janine Graham, and she is at CDC headquarters in New York, and she's standing in front of the UN building. <laughs> CDC headquarters right in New York. All right. Are you all right there, Matt? Because it sounds like you're choking to death. Choking at how dumb that was? <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, Nick was just showing me a picture a of a screenshot of the thing, but she's she's standing in front of the United Nations building. You even see the wall of flags behind her, and it says CDC New York City. Try, just do anything. Yeah, they have the internet at this point. It's 2008. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now this is also kind of a. I actually don't know what this is, but. Everyone thinks it's terrorism at first, and that kind of rears its head when these two... Spencer Breslin fucking gets it. Uh, gets shot and gets his friend killed, too. But everyone thinks it's terrorists. At first, yeah, and then they just... After a while, they kind of, except for Marky Mark, stop trying to figure out what's going on. Marky Mark's the only one going, It's the plants, bro! Well, because Hot Dog Guy tells him. I mean, we'll get to Hot Dog Guy, but Hot Dog Guy is... I wanted, to, I wanted him... I wanted his movie. I wanted him to survive. We don't know if he <laughs> dies or not, actually. We assume he does. Um, I will say, one of my favorite jokes in this is Zoe Deschanel has this line like, oh, you know, everything's gone bad. It's been really rough since blah, 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 blah. I just wish people were nicer to each other. These terrorists are sick. And then they cut to a newspaper. I don't know if you caught this, but it's the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it says Philadelphia on it. Oh, I missed that. I haven't heard of that one in a long time. Uh, oh, wait oh, wait a minute, then. What is this about? Is this about uh, suicide rates or murder? So here, here, no, no, this is before it happened there. So uh, this article by Loyal Baxel is just, people are killing, or, you know, there's a high murder rate in Philadelphia. So my theory on this is, spoiler alert, at the end it shows up in Paris, this is him just saying that people are assholes in New England and in Paris. Right? Well, I mean, yeah. And so the trees will kill them One, all. One, bless your heart later, and it all goes away. <laughs> now, I was also kind of pissed off this took place mostly in Pennsylvania because, again, Night of the Living Dead already covered that. Well, I mean, but, like, also, it's, it's a Night Shyamalan. Of course, it's going to be in Philadelphia. He has to, he has to pick up his kids from school so he can't live in Philadelphia. Well... Um, that's Leguizamo. He has no kids. Very importantly, until the end of this movie, when spoiler alert, he's going to get a kid. Um, but you, uh, we get this kind of 
the uh, Philadelphia, um, I guess, Central Terminal Station. I've never been through, you know, uh, Philly on a train. But John Leguizamo is acting really awkward around Zoe Deschanel, and she figures it out immediately that, oh, you said we've been having marital problems. Um, but, like, he's not hiding it. You know, he's like, oh, I'm glad you're here. And you're just like, oh, no. By the way, if you're going to do Philadelphia, I get it, these are huge stars. But pick people with neutral accents. Like, no matter what, John Leguizamo sounds like he came from the Bronx. Like, he, yeah. he, or, or New Jersey. Like, and Mark Wahlberg just looks mildly surprised and sounds like he's from Boston. Like, that, that, that's what he is. <laughs> you know, like, Mel Gibson, he just has a flat, neutral accent. Well, they try that with Zoe Deschanel here, but the dialogue is such garbage, and everyone gives such a terrible performance. I mean... This is some of the worst acting I've seen in a while. Oh, this is truly atrocious. And, like, the thing is, it's supposed to be kind of a heightened reality. Um, but, like, if this movie was all in, like, Italian and then dubbed, it would be better. <laughs> like, because, like, what's cool are the visuals. It's terribly shot. It's all very well lit. It's strange. Uh, and then every so often, they dramatically cut to, like, a field with a rippling breeze kind of cutting through it. It's they, so strange. Credit where it's due, they can make the breeze vaguely creepy or scary, because when the wind blows, you know something bad's about to happen. Okay, um, the whole, that whole setup reminded me of that South Park episode when they're running from global warming, and it's meant to be a parody of the oh day after God, tomorrow. Yes. The day after tomorrow, though? This is exactly what this is. That's um, we haven't done. Have we done after tomorrow? I don't think no. so. We did twenty twelve. Yeah. Okay. It's the same director. But like at one point, they're literally running away from cold. Like there's a breeze, and he's running away from cold. cold. And you're, yeah, that, that, but you're right, Matt. That, that it's it it works at times, especially near the end of the movie when they're out in the boonies. But at the beginning, like when we don't know what's happening. Um, like, when it first hits Philadelphia, it's a great example of this. Because there's another park in Philadelphia. And this cop knows this cabbie on a first-name basis. <laughs> uh, we then see... You know, people oh, start this dropping. is the one, yeah, where the cop shoots himself, and then the cabbie gets out and shoots himself. And then a lady from the sidewalk, like, steps off the sidewalk, and we see, you know, establishing shot of a bunch of feet, right? Like, because we don't... We uh, don't I'll call Quentin Tarantino. Oh, boy. That's right. Uh, so we see, you know, uh, Tabby in his sandals, Lady in her heels, and they just each shoot themselves in a very difficult way. Like, they must have taken the gun and pointed it at their forehead like this and fired it, and then just one by one until it's out of shots. You know. And then at this point, um, uh, everyone's on a train uh, going to Philly, but they end up... Not, uh, not, not to Philly. They're leaving Philly to go to Princeton, New Jer- towards Princeton, New Jersey, because that's where... John Leguizamo's wife is. Right, but they stop, by the way, at a Filbert, Pennsylvania, which uh, the entire time I saw that, I was going, I'm nauseous. I'm uh, nauseous. There you I'm go. nauseous. And, yeah, and that's because they've lost all communication with anywhere else. Like, it's... Like the vibe I was getting about this part of The Last Babylon, like, Nick, you've read The Last Babylon. Of course, yes. Have you, Daniel? The, the nuclear war novel? Yeah, when, yeah, every, when the, when the war, nuclear war starts and everyone promptly goes and buys out the local store. Right. And so he's just sitting there like, look at me, all this money, I could retire. Well, the apocalypse is happening, so everyone just goes to the local diner. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you're giving it too much credit, but I, I see what you're doing. I think it's because they're stuck in a train station in a very small town in the ex suburbs. They're not that far outside of Philly. They have nowhere else to go. And so while they're trying to figure shit out, they're getting bad grilled cheese sandwiches from from you know a diner. Right. Which is fine. Um, but I will say here, this is also where we're introduced to who Joey is. Uh, Joey, played by M. Night Shyamalan, in what's much more appropriate of a role for him. A dude on the other end of a phone line. Um, yeah, we never see him. We, we never hear his him. voice. And he says, like, I think four or five words. Yeah, he's worried about her because he's, like, oddly crushing on her. And she said, look, we just had dessert one time. Specifically tiramisu, I think, which is a very weird specific detail. Um, but it is, it's just one of these things. Like, yeah, Zoe Deschanel, leave, leave it alone. Stop. Um. Yeah, because she was having issues with her husband, so she went out to dessert with a co-worker who's now approaching fatal attraction levels. And, oh, um, boy. But that plot never goes anywhere. So I was expecting him to show up and Mark, Mark and Mark have to kill him. Oh, really? You thought it would go that far? <laughs> yeah, but then he's, pro- he's probably dead somewhere. Well, I mean, what we're getting to is at this point on the train, everyone freaks out because it has hit Philly. 
and uh, Rittenhouse Park, I think is the name of their central square, or something like that. So, you know, and um, and so now people are dying in Philadelphia. But again, like, this thing doesn't have rules, which is fine, because we, this is him remaking signs, effectively. This smells like signs. Like, the aliens don't have a rhyme or reason. It's not really explained. They could clearly destroy everything, but they don't. We don't know why. And at the end, they've disappeared by an ancient technique from Asia. Or no, the Middle East. The Middle East. Um, fine. But here, like, if you're telling me people are fleeing cities because they're dying in such large number, and everyone we come across kills themselves, is New York empty? Is Philadelphia, like, we, we have no way of knowing. They, they imply that, but they never show it. Well, the, the epilogue hints that within three months, everything is roughly back to normal. Three months to clean out half the population of New York, assuming some people didn't get tree gassed because they were inside. I mean, yeah, I guess. And they, uh, they never even confirmed it's, to use Matt's phrase, tree gas. No. They never explain what's going on. It just stops in about 24 hours. It's like 10 a.m. the next day. Right. It, it, it's over. It's, this whole Which they have this place. weird scientific explanation for. Well, it will peak and then decline at 10 a.m. And they're pulling it out of their ass. How do they know that? No. That, that's part of the thing. I mean, it's one thing if they never explain it, but it's kept ambiguous to the characters as well. But every character's trying to figure out what's going on, and they quote unquote think they've found the right answer. Um, yeah, it, it's just very thin. That's all it is. It's thin because again, like they explain too much, but also not enough. It's it's very strange. Um, after the train stops and they say like there's no communication with anyone anywhere. Again, maybe everyone's dead. We don't know. But at least the phone lines are down or the wires down. Um, Marky Mark is. <coughs> trying to talk to Jess, because Jess is scared that her mom is dead. Turns out we'll never know. We have no idea. Um, but he has this mood ring. Oh, yes, Which the comes ring. up later. But she goes, uh, oh, it's yellow, which means she's nervous. But he goes, oh, that means you're about to laugh. And this is cute. It's fine. It's cute. But, like, Mark, Marky Mark is... I'm sorry, man. Like, I know you wanted to play a science teacher, but you're actually pretty good at playing the action hero cop guy. Um, just stick to it, right? Uh, stick to being the, uh, whatever it's called. Well, was guy. he in The Nice Guys? Yes, he was, I think. That was a good movie. Like, I enjoyed Nice Guys. That's totally fine. Uh, he, about here, we get a, an iPhone with the best death, a uh, student's death, worth it, whatever you want to say. There's a feeder at the Lions. Yeah. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> oh, this was amazing. Yeah, uh, so they're showing the Philly Zoo. Someone filmed it at the Philly Zoo, and there's a guy in there who's presumably one of the zookeepers, uh, and he's, like, taunting the lions, and the lions just start tearing him apart, and we're just watching people watch a snuff film, which is great, but he's, like, just yanking off his arms, and people are screaming. Um... Like, full-on yanking off the zookeeper's arms. Yeah, uh, like, he's he's trying to, like, pet the lioness, and she's not having it. And then she just straight-up tears his arm off at the elbow on screen. It's quite a dramatic death. Uh, that guy went for the gold right there. That That's really, truly something. Um, meanwhile, it's also at this point that they say, well, maybe it's not terrorist. Um... You know, they're saying it's some sort of biological attack. We don't know what it is. The sheer number of incidents makes it unlikely the terrorists have done this. It's not oh, one of the ethics, bro. No, right? I was hoping to beat someone up, bro. But, like, they're showing, like, how it's spreading across New England in the, like, the Northeast. Yeah. And it's everywhere except for, like, Maine and the Canadian border. Well, so, Stephen King was keeping it away from Maine. The like, trees do clack, not clack, mess clack. with him. No. He was under the dome already. Clickety clack, clickety clack. <laughs> uh, it, it, It'd be it, great it, if the secret was cocaine. Like, if you were uh, on cocaine, like you wouldn't be touched. He's like, I'm clean. Oh boy. Um, well, a lot of a lot, a lot of the big cities might not be in such trouble then. Between the yuppies and the crack dens, cocaine keeps the tree gas away. Maybe. Um, but around here, the power goes out, and then someone stands up in the dark. Uh, cafe, the dark diner, and just goes, hey, it doesn't seem to be hitting 60 miles from here. Let's go! And then it's like it's a mad, 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 mad world for a second. It's great. You told me this water was shallow. That whole bit. Yeah, and um, then Julian hitches a ride to Princeton with these people who are going there anyway. 
The home of the dead meats. And he he leaves Jess with um, Marky Mark. Here's the thing. I know you need a ride, and I know you're scared. But if something is killing people with gas, you don't go in a soft root uh, Jeep Cherokee or um, Jeep Wrangler. And and then, like, in the end, like, I guess, spoiler, they're going to get it because there's a cut in the roof. Yeah. But, dude, it's still a canvas roof. The thing leaks air like crazy. You're going to die no matter what. Like, close the vents. Fuck you. This is a Jeep Wrangler. All it does is whistle as it drives down the street. That's why you buy it. Um, meanwhile, John Leguizamo, while he's going with the, the college kids to Princeton, um, Mark Wahlberg, Zoe Chanel, and the kid Jess uh, get picked up by, I mean, I don't even think we're given their names. They're just, they own a nursery, and they're running home to get supplies. It's a married couple. The guy is the guy who... I think was in Silence of the Lambs as one of the um, uh, uh, bug experts that like explains the, what the Death's Head Moth is. So it's not that? if it rubs the pollen on the skin or else it gets the tree gas again? No, but he is the guy also in the latest uh, season of Twin Peaks, which might yes, be well the last one, uh, who explains the arm wrestling competition. Yeah. yeah. Previous episode, Over the Top. Uh, he's also, um... Well, in Twin Peaks, it ends with somebody getting their face taped in, so... Yeah. Hey, yeah. That's the unrated director's cut. Well, I mean, it's David Lynch, so everything's an unrated director's cut. He's also... You know, I just gotta show people getting their faces caved in. Showtime, you gotta give me the money to do that. Uh, he's also in, um, uh, The Village, previous episode this month. Um... But he's in one of my favorite movies of all time, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? He plays um, the older brother who at the beginning tries to sell it out to the cops. Oh, oh, um, uh, Wash Hog Wallop. R U N N O F T, that guy? That's him. Yes. Uh, you got an R O N N O F T. Uh, he plays that uh, John Saturo's brother. Yes. Uh, cousin? Cousin. Um, yeah, so it's good. Anyway, there's this very long scene here where John Leguizamo is trying to convince him to take his daughter, and then he gets real intense, like, don't take her hand unless you mean it. And you're just like, all right, creepy. Uh, you're going to go with these nice people so I can save your mom from trying to buy you a birthday present. I hope that doesn't ruin you for the rest of your life. Bye! Uh, they drive towards New Jersey, um, the traditional uh, ancestral home of the Leguizamo. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rest of them go, and by the way, uh, fuck John Leguizamo. Uh, he's making these people wait, and they keep threatening to drive away, and he's like, keeps dragging this out. This is the apocalypse guy. Like, if they tell you to go, you fucking go. Um, meanwhile, uh, the three of them go with the nursery people, um, who, again, have no names, as I could tell. Couple, hippie, hippie dude and hippie chick. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the credits, they're literally nursery owner and nursery owner's wife, uh, which... Considering how many lines he has, you'd think they would have tried a little harder. Mm. Oh, it's it's M. Night Shyamalan, so no, no one was trying. They should have called him, like, Vienna Sausage or something, because the guy loves hot dogs. Hmm. Um, anyway, so they run to this farmhouse. He has to grow up in the shadow of Three Mile Island, which is a nice touch. Like, you see the cooling towers off in the distance. It looks distance. like a matte painting, like the smoke never moves. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a weird composite shot. Um, anyway, uh, so while they're at this nursery, um, you know, he goes like, I have to get this, because this line is so good, he goes, uh, we're getting hot dogs for the road, you know, hot dogs get a bad rap, they're a cool shape, they got protein, you like hot dogs, right? And you're just like, okay, this movie was partially sponsored by the hot dog board. Lady, he's putting my kids through college. But then, but like... And later he's just eating cold hot dogs. Like it's 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 really something. You mean you don't like hot dogs there, Nicholas? You know the gas stations have the best hot dogs. My favorite Quick video. Trip, please sponsor this podcast. <laughs> no, that's no, never gonna happen. Really. Um, it's not gonna happen. But like my favorite videos he had, um, other than of course his weather reports, which were great. They, they're still great. They come out. And would you? believe it it is friday once again but is that one where he's sitting in the back of a car and he goes i had a coke and two cookies it's a good day (laughs) (laughs) he is just he's a he's a delight do you remember the ice bucket challenge where he did it and was playing a trumpet the entire time it's like well now i want to 
challenge Vladimir Putin. <laughs> yes. Um. Anyway, so Hot Dog Guy, they load up the car. They're driving to wherever they can go. Oh, and the leg was on, though, at this point. Um, uh, they eventually crash their car after uh, he notices that tear in the roof, and then he gets out and uh, sits down in the middle of the road and slits his wrists. Well, I would say these are some of the best deaths. Um, they get to Princeton, and there's a landscaping company that has all hanged themselves. Like, there's a fucking little, uh, the little people from um, Wizard of Oz. Like, no, that never happened. It's just the urban legend, you see. Uh, but then a girl in there starts freaking out, and he's like, let me give you a math puzzle, because that's what you want to do when you're having trouble. Oh, right. Yeah. I'll give you one penny at the start of the month. How much money would you end up with at the end of the month? If you double it, if you double it every day. day. And he goes, and she goes like 30 bucks, and then you realize she's gone, because everyone's freaking yeah. out. Uh, and he goes, it's $10 million. It's it's over ten million dollars, and they pan outside the car, and the 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 Wrangler stops right, and then it accelerates like crazy, and then he just faces. Uh, we see the driver and the girl come out the front of the car. Leguizamo stumbles out and cuts himself with some glass. Yes, it's Bruce. Like this is a pretty effective fucking shot. Um, I don't know if it could have been effective. I don't know if the way they handled it was effective. Because it's, uh, it should have been a close-up, frankly. They should have had uh, a close-up on Leguizamo's face as he's doing it. But no, it's like... Uh, it's a middle shot. Yeah. Um, I will say the stuff in the car, though, is effective. Like, the people are panicking. It's a lot of... It, it is what you wanted. It was the tight shots. He's sweating. He notices the cut in the ceiling. Like, but at the end of the day, they're still trying to outrun a virus, which isn't how that works. No, it's not. Um, and I will also say, too, that he sh- that we need more of the crazy because people are saying crazy. I will say the old lady at the end does the proper amount of crazy because if your brain is just freaking out and you're trying to kill yourself, she just keeps smashing her head against the wall. Like That, that would make sense. But like... What I want is him to be uh, Leo DiCaprio again in The Aviator. You know, Wave of Future, Wave of Future. Mm-hmm. Like, he should just be like the Penny's doubling. The, 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 the doubling, doubling, doubling. Like, it kind of happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen other times. Because, like, Private Pyle later on, he's doing that. Like, he's doing his military drill. Makes no sense. Why does he get extra lines? Some people just freeze and <gasps> cut their throat. Oh, yeah, they run into an army private who is stationed at a nearby base mm-hmm. and, um, uh, they try and lead him and another group of survivors to some farmhouse. And, and, he's, and he's reporting that everyone at the base, he was out away from the base and was heading back in. Everyone at the base just threw themselves onto the barbed wire. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, like, that's effective. We don't know why he wasn't, like, he wasn't infected right then. We have no idea. But he's describing trauma. Trauma that we could have cut to just briefly. Uh, looking like the trenches in 1917 or something. Like, I, I, it's so much dumber than that, though. I mean, the way we're describing it actually sounds competent. Like, uh, for example, at one point, uh, Marky Mark's in the car listening to conspiracy radio about what could be causing the virus. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you right now, Prison Planet Not TV has got exclusive information here, and it's the goddamn globalists led by George Soros. They're making everyone in in New York kill themselves. I got the info right here, folks. And then there, after that, immediately, um, he like goes, hey, everybody, there's a house over there, which everybody can clearly see. Well, I mean, this is where we are <laughs> at the point where, like, um, uh, they're like, hey, are those animals in the road? And they're just corpses. Yeah. Everyone, everywhere is just corpses. Um, meanwhile, there's a should... lot of history down that road. That's right. Uh, we should also mention that no matter what, his mood ring, when he's wearing it, is always on blue because he's calm and lovable at all times. <laughs> because, like, nothing phases him. He's just like, hey, bro. Although, at one point, they're asking for answers, like, give me a second, guys. I need to figure it out. Hey, guys. Hey, what's going on? Give me a yeah, second. Because the, the wind starts blowing, and um, Private Pyle starts repeating the, his gun training. You know, my handgun is my friend. It never leaves my side. And then a second later, bang. Which is, by the way, not really a thing. Uh, he's again. This is a movie that should have the internet because brace yourself. It's just um, a little jacket, <laughs> but he got the line wrong, right? Yeah. Like, it, it, uh, anyway, 
This so is my rifle. Looks this like is my gun. Made for TV. Adam Sandler shows up as this ensign or as this private, uh, who at this point I guess has just stolen a Humvee. <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, yeah. What are they going to do about it? Everyone else is on barbed wire. Well, but then they start looking to this poor, like, 20, 20, well, I mean, he's, like, looks like he's 45, but he's a private. They start looking at him for answers, and he has no answers because he's just a private in the military. Um, and, uh, but, you know, at this point, uh, what is not an effective scene, but kind of is neat, is they're at this kind of, like, five-way junction, and there's people escaping coming from each direction. So that... Uh, presumably what they thought was a village just around the corner that could be okay, there's no hope. Now, why does this movie occasionally try to be meta, but at the same time try to be completely serious? Because when they get to that farmhouse that uh, Marky Mark had noticed, uh, Betty Buckley's there, and uh, if you remember her, I think she was the, one of the characters on Aiders and Nuss. Big theater actress, too, but I think anyway, at one point in time, somebody describes her as, quote, real exorcist which it's like, why are you referencing other horror movies well, right now in, in this? What does that mean? Well, it could be that, you know, in universe, the exorcist existed, but we, we skip the part where, um, we skip the part where these two middle schoolers who are rolling with them get shot semi-seriously trying to break into some dude's house. Oh, yeah. I say semi-seriously because I think the dude kind of overreacted because they are clearly, like, trying no, to sound Well, tough. he shoots a 13-year-old's head off, basically. Well, I mean, that kid did not... That kid sounds like he's a 12-year-old trying to be ghetto, like this ghetto thug type and failing miserably. Hmm. I, mean, I would not have taken <sighs> him seriously, but then again, he is trying to open a window. Get off my land! In which he's trying to open a window when there's poison gas in the air, but... Still. Give us some food, please, bitch. Yeah, no, I mean... Again, it's not horrifying. It's comical, those scenes. Uh, so much of this movie is unintentionally hilarious, especially when they try to go meta with it, which doesn't work, but then there are scenes like, like that where the murder of a kid should be horrifying, but because of the way it's handled, it's just unintentional comedy. I don't remember it being... I don't remember the actual killing being funny. The kids trying to act tough when they are so not is right. funny. Yeah, that, either way, not appropriate for what they were going for here. Yeah, and so, okay, now we're down two middle schoolers. It's just... um, It's just Marky Mark and his, his funky bunch. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Marky Mark, his wife, and Julian's daughter... Right. And they figured out that the poison really only affects people in large groups, so insert social distancing joke here. And so that's they What social distancing joke do you have to insert there, Matt? Stay apart six feet apart from each other or you die. That's not quite a joke, but that's kind of what we're going for in this movie, so I'll allow it. And then they find this house in the woods where there's this creepy old lady who lets them stay and serves them dinner because she thinks that's something she's supposed to do. She's like, um, what's her name in the stand? Uh, the Not Mother Abigail. Mother Abigail's too nice. She's kind of like Mother Abigail, just a lot meaner. You know, isn't Mother Abigail supposed to be like Jesus or something? Well, yeah. Basically, she's she supposed to be like Moses or, uh, possibly even God. Yeah, so she's like, okay, well, I should let you stay here and give you dinner. It's almost like, I don't like you, but this is, I feel obligated to. And it turns out she's been living alone a little too long. She's getting really paranoid. Yeah. And yelling at people. And then, of course, she kills herself by bashing her head through a bunch of windows. Yeah, our yeah, colleague Nick had to step away for a moment. She kept smashing her head through windows like silently crunch, crunch, crunch. Eventually gets her neck caught on the broken glass. Mm -hmm. And so Marky Mark ends up hiding in the house while his wife and Jess hide in like the shed out back where there's an old secret tube they can talk to each other because this was an underground railroad stop. Yeah. Oh, that that's what was going on. I was just like, oh, there's a random tube that allows people to talk to each other, which... 
and they how that makes sense. And they start having real profound conversations. Eventually decide, you know, we're going to die regardless. Let's die together. So they all dramatically walk towards each other. The wind starts blowing, and then they don't die because I guess the power of love. I feel like I, I can't remember the lyrics of the song, or else I start singing it. No, I, I know what you're talking about. Marty McFly's uh, holding on to the back of a pickup truck somewhere. Uh, no, I mean, uh, there's this whole bit where they both go outside, and it's like, oh, sick, bro. We're going to get the virus together, and then we're going to want to die together, bro. And they decide they're okay with that, but it doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like what uh, my Twitter commentary. Check out, you know, at Matthew W. Quinn. You might see what movie we're doing next. Oh, yeah, you're he's very active on Twitter, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to get a lot of good stuff there. And so I'm like, so the the power of love convinced the trees to show mercy. Because that's just when the predicted poison stops because the newscasts are saying, oh, it's going to peak at 10 a.m. Or something like that. Mm. I don't know what's going on in this movie. Uh, well, I do, but it's really remarkably dumb. <laughs> yeah. And um, let's see. Uh, well, for one, this is meant to be the big emotional climax, them meeting up with each other after they've been separated because they were having marital problems. And I felt nothing because they're such badly defined characters. Yeah, it's not even clear what their marital problems were. I mean, crying on the wedding day, I mean, one could be nervous, not, oh God, I don't want to marry him, but I can't stop. Yeah. Or maybe something else happened. I mean, Julian could have really screwed something up there if he by keeping his mouth open like he was. Like Nick was saying, you take that to your grave. I imagine it's something more like that because... First and foremost, you're right. People are going to cry at their own weddings for a whole bunch of reasons. It's a very uh, big roller coaster of a day. And, and it's not clear what kind of issues you're even having in the first place. Like, I, mean, I think they do talk about how she didn't think she was ready to have kids or something. So is that the issue? I mean, it's not... Well, considering this ends with uh, Zoe Deschanel getting a positive pregnancy test. Character arc. I guess so. Oh, maybe this is a good movie. And, uh, Shy, I'm a man, a I'm a man, I'm a man, a man, uh, put a lot of thought into it. Uh, that sounds like something you do on purpose with a character arc, but it's not clear why they were having marital problems in the first place. <laughs> so, and three months later, apparently, um, Marky Mark and Zoe Deschanel have adopted Jess, so I guess Jess's mom died too. And yeah. they've reopened the schools, and they're not masking or maintaining social distancing. Bad. Oh, it's over, bro. <laughs> and they're sending Jess off to school, and Zoe turn Jess now turns out is pregnant, and all is well. Maybe cut to Paris, where the wind is blowing and people are freezing. Dun 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 dun. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of. Uh, People in Paris, they're acting the same way. Uh, they start freezing and then walking backwards, which is the first sign of, uh, well, not the first sign, but a sign that they've been infected with whatever's going on here. Yeah, yeah. so apparently the killing off most of the population of everywhere north of New, north of New Jersey was a warning shot from the trees to teach people to respect the environment. Am I the only one who, every time I hear about the threat from the trees, is thinking about that Aqua Teen Hunger Force where um, uh, uh, Shake dumps a bunch of oil in the middle of the forest and the trees come and, like, kidnap him and Carl and put them on trial? Do you remember that one? No, I haven't seen that one. Totally. Uh, yeah. Well, they're, they are close to New Jersey. They could, they could meet Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Let's have a crossover. Yeah, why not? Well, I mean... I know we're trying to end soon, but, like, none of this makes sense, right? Like, at all. Like, at, at one point, as they're saying, well, maybe small, it was stay individual, small groups, and then, of course, it gets worse and worse. I know you already talked about the lady who, who you know, goes crazy and dies with the most metal death of all time by headbutting herself. We, like, so our group ends up with, like, so many stupid things in this. They end up with two kids, one played by Spencer Breslin, one played by 
uh, a black kid whose name I'm forgetting. Uh, Robert Bailey. His name's Jared. Um, you've seen him in probably nothing. Yeah, no, he wasn't anything. He was a voice in Coraline, which is pretty cool. Ah, uh, I like Coraline. Anyway, but like the first thing they find is a model house. There's no one there. It's empty. Why not just stay in the model house? Food. As all the food is fake. I guess, but like the next place they go, Trent Breslin just starts punching the door and goes, "Hey, let us in, let us in." So he gets shot and he gets Jared killed. Yeah, the, they sound so unthreatening. Like, let us in. Bitch. It's just Spencer Breslin being, like, trying to talk tough, I guess. But it's just, it's all strange. There's just nothing to it. Like, at one point, they come across a truck that's empty. Keys are in it. No bodies. Nothing. It's just, the, the, it, it's a lot of narrative convenience, which, again, makes it feel like signs. But, like, I don't know. It's just, it's just strange. Uh, and then the lady, like you, you guys already mentioned, like, she dies a cool metal death. But, like... The whole point of her, we have, once again, the secrets of the Underground Railroad. Um, I, th- I think the point of her was that you now the tr- now people were dying individually. Well, right. But she doesn't follow the news. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't want to know what's going on. Fine. Uh, maybe she's Mother Nature. Who knows? Um, but, like, she has this house where they're staying in the guest quarters. She also has a full-size doll in her bed. Right? It's time for some southern gothic, except this is in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and none of it matters. Get out of my house. Supposed, Get out of my house. I think they're supposed to establish that she's insane. I guess. Like, th- these are all interesting things that don't matter at all, which is weird. And then at the end, like, they go out the next morning, like, um, the shot is weird. The shot is poorly constructed. I didn't know if they were right next to each other or whatever, but apparently they're on other sides of the entire field. Yeah, um, Jess and Zoe Deschanel are hiding in the runaway slave hiding house, and Marky Mark is hiding in the main house, and they decide, at this point, we're going to die because individuals are dying, so it's all three die together. Right. And, and they slow-mo across the fields. And then nothing happens. Because the power of love convinced the Ents to lay off the genocide. But see, like, but here's the thing. It sounds like Matt's making fun of it. We don't know. I th- no one explains it. I, that's why I'm making fun of it. But I think you're right, though. Because, like, the lady was a pain in the ass, so she had to die. But these people, they, they show love, I guess. So they get to live? Who knows? I, although my favorite scene, there's a scene where they're in the model house, and they're staying because even though the food's fake, the bathrooms are real. The little girl has to go to the bathroom, Right. Marky Mark realizes that the corner of the office is a plastic plant, right? And he starts talking to the plant because yes. that's what hot dog guy said. He goes, hey, bro, are we okay, bro? Yeah, bang, begging the plant for mercy, and that turns out it's fake. I hope it's okay, bro. I'm not trying to hurt you or anything. And then he flips over and it's plastic, and she's just like... <laughs> there, there is a scene in this movie in which a man talks to a plastic plant. And that makes sense in context. And no, it doesn't. That's that's the line that ends the scene. I think right? he goes, I'm talking to a plastic plant. I'm still doing it. Cut the scene. <laughs> like, it's it's truly something. And like <laughs> I don't know. I I would have stayed in the model house. I know see the thing is though, they don't know how long these are gonna last. But like the you plastic a, plant, you mean? <laughs> no, no, the apocalypse. Turns out it's only another, like, six hours, so... Yeah, so, you know, middle school preppy boys who tried to be tough maybe didn't have to get shot by the paranoid dude. But It's terrorist, you're a terrorist. And at one point, Marky Mark literally picks up the wine glass and, like, he forgets and tries to drink from it. It doesn't work. But, like, then we get this shot from the hillside, and they're like... Hey, bro, those two groups of people are getting pretty close together. Oh, oh, and then one dude lies down in front of a lawnmower. That's why I wanted to mention it. it's the best death in the movie. Oh, yeah. And then... He starts the lawnmower. It starts to go in, like, a little, like, circle, and he just lies down and it drives over him. Like, it is... Well, initially, there's, like, no gore whatsoever until it, like, goes over the entire upper half of his body, and then... Well, but, like, this, I mean, first of all... I don't know why he had to be so far away. It's clearly bad telephoto digitally, but 
What's cool about it is the guy just is lying on the like prone on his back, not moving, not responding to the fact that he's getting bared down upon by a lawnmower. Like that's fucking freaky. Um, but like, yeah, everything about this like this stilted script. Like the kids are asking, like, why don't you have kids? Because what are you doing, fat kid? Like, leave me alone. Like, it's just so much of this means nothing. Um, and then yeah, old lady dies. Um, but like her death is awesome. Like her we, death. We, we talked about her metal death. But like her eyes are gouged out. It's it's cool. And then the next morning, none of it mattered. Like, <laughs> and I know like Ben was already talking about this too. But like three months like go by, everyone's living back in Philly. Everything's fine. And now it's time for those fucking Frenchmen to get it. Like it's yeah. If 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 they if the trees kill off half of New England and everything up in North Jersey to make some kind of point about deforestation, now they're going to kill the French who are even more green than we are. Like laws against wasting food, you have to plant trees on top of buildings. But, but like How you, did the Amazon come to life and kill people who are logging too much. That, like. But that that's why sense. I think you were right. It's the power of love. That, like, the, the whole stereotype of Parisians being assholes to each other. The only, literally, the only thing I can figure out. Um, uh, although I guess congratulations to him for actually filming in France. Like he left Philadelphia, you did it. Yeah, so his kids must have been out of school that week, so he could leave Philadelphia. Congratulations. Uh, we're going on a, a trip to Paris. Yay. Um, but yeah, so this is the happening. Yeah, it was better than Lady in the Water, but still not that good. Final thoughts, man? That's, those are my final thoughts. I mean, I'm, at least it's short. Yeah, basically the fact that this is 90 minutes is the only thing going for it. This was a bad script and bad acting. I... I seriously can't remember the last time I've seen such bad acting in a major motion picture. I mean, this is like birdemic levels of acting here. I, it's so grating and it's so bizarre, and it's the script is just totally all over the place, and it's not good. No, don't don't check this out. See, it's funny. I love John Leguizamo, but he's wasted in this. Everyone's wasted in this. Um, I. I kind of like, um, I even like the new girl. I mean, Zoe Deschanel is not the best part of it, but she's fine in it. She's been good in things. It's, and I mean, I'm sorry, Mark Wahlberg. Um, I know you don't want to always be like the goon type, but you're really good at being a goon. You know, a cop, a criminal, like a, a headbuster. You're good at that. And he's, and he's in things I like. It's just, this is bad. Although I will disagree with both of you. I'd say you should see this because this is, if there's ever been a seeing is believing movie, it's this. Like, there's a guy who goes on like a hot dog rant for 45 seconds, and you're not going to find that anywhere else. Um, but uh, I guess I digress. I, I think this movie's bad, uh, and I think for all the reasons we've talked about, Daniel is right. This movie is uh, particularly grating um, as far as acting goes. It's some of the worst acting we've we've done. Um, Zoe Deschanel's entire direction must have just been stop blinking. No, no, no. I'm thinking about blinking. Don't do it. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, I think it's bad. Um, we've been uh, making an effort here to tell you the movie that's coming up next. Uh, so we'll tell you the next movie. The next movie, uh, speaking of the apocalypse, uh, we're doing Soylent Green. Uh, it's people! It's, it's, it's made out of people. That I thought for decades a line was, Soylent Green is people. No, it's Soylent Green is made out of people. Is that Today the line? I learned. Huh. Well, uh, for those of you who followed Matt uh, six weeks ago, uh, he live tweeted this. Uh, but in honor of the fact that Slim Green takes place in the year of our Lord 2022, we thought it would be uh, worth mentioning. We thought it would be a fun one to do. Uh, one of the older movies, I guess, we will uh, do here. Uh, but thanks for doing everything you guys do. Listening, supporting, subscribing, all those kinds of things. Uh, keep reviewing us and keep sharing us around. Um, and we'll see you next week when we cover Soylent Green with Geraldine Heston. Bye, guys. Season 9 of Myopia Movies is produced by Nick Hoffman and Daniel Sattis. 
It is hosted by Nick Hoffman and stars Daniel Sledis and Matt Quinn. The theme music is Surf Shimmy by Kevin McLeod of Incomtech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and review us wherever podcasts are found. Thanks, guys.